Hello everyone, my name is Pam Burgess. I'm going to be talking to you today on the introduction to contrast enhanced ultrasound for echocardiography. I'm really excited and I'm pleased that ICAS has asked me to record this webinar. Contrast is something that's been very dear and close to my heart for many, many years. Uh, so it's um, exciting to get to bring this um, webinar to you today. First of all, if we're scanning without contrast, uh, it's kind of like we're blinded because there can be things hiding in the ventricle. For instance, uh, this ventricle here where you can see that there's an apical wall motion abnormality. Uh, we may think we see good endocardial definition or that we can rule out a thrombus, but you know, even though the equipment gets better and better, uh, with our near field resolution, we still see artifacts or things that make us suspicious, especially in this patient, to whether they have uh, maybe a thrombus hiding there. And we can't be certain unless we use contrast to totally rule those out. So uh, this is um, a, a great case example where we can image the heart fairly well, but I think contrast is still beneficial to rule out a thrombus here. Okay, so let's get started, um, first of all, by talking about ultrasound contrast agents that we use or have used in the past. So if we just go across the top of the screen here, we're going to be talking about the agents, not so much who manufactures them, but the shell of the contrast agent, the gas that's within inside the bubble, and, and kind of about the diameter of the bubble itself. So those of you that have been scanning for a long time and, and used contrast for a long time, you may be used Albunex. And that was one of the first um, contrast agents that I ever used. It's been many years ago. Um, and we can see that the shell was albumin, the gas is air, and it, it was a rather um, large bubble for um, that point of the game there with us using contrast. Um, many of us that used Albunex uh, didn't even have second harmonics then. So we would be sitting there waiting, is the contrast there yet? I think I can see some. So from the first generation agent to the second, we made a huge leap with our image quality with contrast. Definity, Optison, Lumison are all second generation uh, contrast agents. And when we began using those, we had second harmonics. So it, our equipment really helped us to better image uh, the, the contrast. So we can tell here that the shells vary between the three that we probably everyone's using clinically here. They vary some. Um, so does the gas. And so does the uh, mean diameter of those three bubbles, too. And now there's even third generation contrast agents coming out. Probably most of these are uh, still in research now, um, but clinically I think we're probably all using one of these right here. So next let's talk about the bubble itself, the different components of the bubble. The shell is where we're going to start and it determines how easily the contrast is taken up in the circulation. So a more hydrophilic material is taken up easier. The more elastic the bubble or the shell is, the more acoustic energy it can withstand before the bubble burst. And so that's really important. And we have to remember that this is why we reduce our mechanical index with contrast. And it reduces the time that the contrast is available for imaging. So if we have our mechanical index set very high, uh, we'll, we'll burst all the bubbles. And then, so we'll have a very short imaging time. So we have to reduce our mechanical index to save our shell. And again, um, this day and time, most of them are composed of, of these three agents there. Okay, next, let's talk about the gas core. It determines the echogenicity. The gas is um, compressed, they oscillate, and then they reflect when they're hit with ultrasound. And this is when we see um, the contrast agent. They're mainly composed of air, heavy gases. The heavy gases are usually a little less water-soluble, um, which will help them last longer in the circulation. 
The size of the contrast agents today range from one to four micrometers in diameter. And remember, that's smaller than a red blood cell. So these can easily go through the circulation, pass through the lungs. And they're a lot more uniform in size than they used to be, a lot more uniform in size than when we do saline contrast. And that's really important because it, it gives us a, a finer uh, image with contrast. So some advantages of contrast are that uh, it provides a real-time evaluation of the heart, which is important. So we can, we can right away add contrast to our echo images, rule out a thrombus, see um, maybe wall motion abnormalities that we weren't able to see without contrast. It's safer than other contrast agents too that are used in like in invasive uh, cardiac testing. It's more cost effective than moving on to a different type image. Say, if we say we can't see all the walls of the heart and the patient has to go to a nuclear or, or a catheterization, echo with even the addition of contrast is still more cost effective than moving to one of those more um, invasive type procedures. And also we can do contrast, add contrast on our portable procedures. And these, if we think about it, are some of our most difficult patients. When we go to the ICUs, our, our patients are flat on their back, they're on ventilators. These are probably the most important patients that we're adding contrast to. Again, there's disadvantages of contrast. You know, there's the decreased time in circulation, but we've already learned how we can um, maybe prolong the contrast agent in circulation. Remember, it produces heat with increased frequencies, and, and this, you know, at times can cause some issues. Um, and remember that the bubble will burst with low frequencies and high mechanical indexes. So we can avoid those situations there. So what will contrast help us to improve? Ideally, we all started out with endocardial border definition and it enhanced the wall motion for stress testing for us. And that's those of us who've utilized contrast for a, a long period of time, this is where we started with contrast, was with stress testing. It, it helps to provide a border for tracing of an EF, and this can be with transthoracic um, images. It helps us um, to visualize wall motion abnormalities that maybe we weren't able to see without contrast. Um, sometimes we give a surprise and um, we'll give contrast and then we note that there's an apical uh, hypertrophy there. Contrast also helps us to enhance other pathology such as a thrombus in the ventricle or maybe even in the atrium. Uh, we can utilize contrast with transesophageal echoes. At times it's questionable whether there's a left atrial appendage thrombus Sometimes the pectinate muscle can mimic a thrombus, so um, it's important that we completely rule that out so we can utilize contrast even with transesophageal echo. Aortic dissection, sometimes we get that linear artifact. Contrast can help clear that artifact. And we can even use uh, contrast to help enhance Doppler signals. And uh, that is, I'll show you some examples of that in just a minute where it greatly helps. So patient monitoring, what's, what's the sonographer's role? Really our role starts um, before we even give the agent and that is to educate the patient about a contrast agent and the potential side effects. Most often when we're describing to the patient the use of contrast, we um, often get back, you know, I don't want this contrast, um, I'm afraid it's going to affect my kidneys or give me a reaction because they're talking about the x-ray contrast. So we have to explain to them that this agent is not like that. Warning signs for a potential um, reaction usually occur within the first 90 seconds. So sometimes they may see flushing, a discomfort, headache, blank pain, some itchiness, or shortness of breath. So always have a medication box or a crash cart present, just in case. So what impacts contrast image quality? Well, the difficulty of the unenhanced images is one of the key factors there. Sometimes we get patients that are so difficult, contrast can't even salvage the image, but that's rare. 
um, IV placement. Proper IV placement can help um, the contrast agent, um, the image quality with that. Your injection technique can also affect this, and of course your equipment settings. So let's start with IV placement. IV placement is very important. We want it in the non-dependent right arm. If you think about how we have our patients positioned for an echo, they're on their left side, most often with their left arm above their head. So we want to be able to move the arm, so we always utilize the right arm if possible. We go as proximal as possible too, because we don't want the contrast agent to have to travel further or even in smaller veins. We also inject on, in the IV as close to the hub as possible. This eliminates the contrast passing through any um, more tubing and, and where we may experience it adhering to the tubing. Do we use an existing IV? Absolutely. If the patient has a head lock in, we'll go ahead and inject into that. But first we test it just to make sure it's gonna work. We flush it with IV fluids just to make sure that it's a, a good patent IV. If there's any meds running in the existing IV, sonographers must have an RN shut those meds off. Sonographers should never inject into a central line or a pick line either. So ensure that there is an injection site again close to the hub. So techniques that we use. I think that probably the most important thing is that there's good communication among staff. So there may be a nurse um, administering the contrast and they have no idea what the, uh, the echo is showing. So sometimes if we have reduced left ventricular function, we as sonographers know that we may need a little more forceful injection. We need to flush a little faster. We may even need to give more contrast. So if we have a nurse uh, administering the contrast, we're going to need to communicate all of that to that nurse. And you don't have to say the functions down, but what you, you know, you need to communicate that, give me a little more contrast, push a little faster on this one. Timing is also very important, especially with stress testing. Uh, when the patient comes back off the treadmill, we want to ensure that that contrast is in the left ventricle, not in the right ventricle, but in the left ventricle. We um, want to make sure that we have good filling of the left ventricle too. So timing is, is very important and that's probably one of the most challenging things we do with contrast and stress is getting it there on the in-post images perfectly. And that takes time. There's a bit of a learning curve there. So proper technique, again, the IV site's important, proper dose the speed of the injection. You know, we find that some of our uh, nurses, when we go to begin training them, they like to bolus um, the injection in. So we have to slow them down a bit. Uh, they want to bolus the flush in too. So we have to, we have to slow them down a bit. Um, we also have some agents that we can dilute and we see varying um, dilutions on those. So you know, just make sure you tweak that in your lab and, and you have that down. And I would also encourage you to consistently do it, the dilution, the same way. Uh, push, push the contrast agent to ensure good filling of the apex. A lot of times what we're trying to do is rule out an apical thrombus. So we want to make sure that we have good filling in that area. And, and that can be the most challenging too. So proper injection technique. Um, we usually, again, with an initial injection of about 0.3 to 0.5 ml of, of the contrast agent and then follow um, with a, a flush, a, so, a really slow saline flush. Or if you're diluting the contrast too, you may just want to give about 3 ml over about 10 seconds is a good place to start. You may need to Speed that up a bit if you're not getting a good concentration of contrast. If the ejection fraction is low and or there's an apical wall motion abnormality, again, you may want to give a more vigorous flush or add more contrast just to uh, fill the apex there. If the patient is large, you may need to give that patient more contrast as well. So here's an example of attenuation. We can see a lot of contrast in the apex, uh, 
but then not so much. See how we kind of lose the borders from the uh, mid ventricle back to the base of the heart there. But we have good apical filling here. So the way we teach our sonographers to administer contrast is we have them push toward just some very mild attenuation, not to this point right here. This um, doesn't allow for good uh, filling back in here or good visualization of the ventricle there. So, But I just wanted to show you an example of what attenuation looks like. So here's one where uh, the left ventricle has a little slower flow, the ejection fraction's lower. So typically what we see with that, even though we've got um, a fairly good concentration of contrast here, we see some swirling within the left ventricle. And, and that's kind of normal. Um, we uh, give more contrast to ensure good filling, but we will typically see some swirling there. How do we eliminate swirling, though, that's, that's not due to a low EF? We make sure that our mechanical index is set properly. Again, check your preset. Make sure you're in your contrast preset, which should have lowered your mechanical index. We look at the administration rate, um, and maybe it should be increased to ensure adequate filling. Maybe we should do our flush a little faster with saline, and we may even need more contrast. Again, this will occur with low flow states in the left ventricle. Sometimes we'll have the patient raise their right arm if the contrast is being administered through the right arm just to enhance the flow of contrast. We'll have them open and close their fist. We'll even have our um, person that's administering the contrast kind of milk the arm to squeeze it to enhance the venous flow to get more contrast in the heart. So here's an example of contrast timing where it's, it's not exactly perfect, okay? So we do see some contrast in the left ventricle, but if we look over here, we see that we have a lot more contrast in the right ventricle. So the contrast was probably just inject, injected and we've not given it time to get into the left ventricle to get an adequate con uh, concentration here. So you have to wait it out sometimes and just wait for the contrast to come over inside the left ventricle and, and properly um, concentrate there in the left ventricle instead of being in the right. So contrast prepar preparation. Always follow the manufacturing guidelines. Each agent is gonna be different. Some require shaking, some require reconstituting, some require just resuspending. So make sure that um, before administering the contrast, when you have it, you know, we resuspend it in the vial and then we resuspend it in the syringe prior to injecting. Make sure that you always resuspend prior to administering the contrast. You may lay it down, not need it for a few minutes. When you inject again, make sure that you resuspend. We tell our sonographers not to use stopcocks to administer contrast. We want to eliminate as many things that the a contrast can adhere to. So we just say no stopcock. Some contrast agents may be diluted. You know, determine your guidelines for your lab and what you require there. Contrast equipment settings. I would encourage everyone to set up and utilize a contrast preset. And most all the machines these days have a contrast preset put on them. Uh, this is uh, just your starting point. Since all patients are different, it's, this contrast preset is not unlike any other preset on your machine. It's your starting point. You want to make sure that it includes harmonics that you've got a decreased mechanical index. We recommend 0.1 to 0.6, but you can vary these. You know, you can vary your mechanical index. If you have a very thick walled chest patient, you may want to go up on it, especially if you're doing a trans thoracic echo, because you've got a lot of contrast to use there. So if you destroy a few bubbles, you're okay. You can, um, you can stand to increase your mechanical index a little bit. Remember that the gains that you want to be tweaking are your TGCs and your overall 2D gain. These are your receiver gains, so they don't affect your mechanical index. Also, optimize your dynamic range or compression, whatever your machine calls it. This is your levels of gray, 
it will bring it to a more contrasty image. So you'll if you'll be able to see by bringing the dynamic range or compression down, you'll be able to see a more uh, black and white image that will show you your borders better. Also place your focal zone at the mitral valve level. And usually that's included in your preset. So here's a patient that we did many years ago. Um, and what happened was the sonographer did not go into the contrast preset. And if you look up top here, you'll see the mechanical index is 1.6. And that's usually what we use for unenhanced imaging. So I can tell right away they weren't using the contrast preset. So you can see here you don't have good filling of the left ventricle due to um, bubble destruction there from the high mechanical index. Okay. Another example here, I don't see any contrast or very little contrast in the left ventricle. I can see that they're not using harmonics, which greatly helps the visualization of contrast in the, in the ventricle here. So I can tell right away this echo was not done under the contrast preset. And, you know, remember I told you about the Albunex days when we didn't have second harmonics? This is kind of what we saw. So not a lot of contrast in the, um, uh, the left ventricle there. Okay, steps that you want to use for your contrast study. So you want to explain the need to use contrast to the patient. Usually we just walk in. Your images are very difficult. They can be difficult for various reasons because right away the patient's always thinking something's wrong. So we need to ease that patient's concerns and just explain to them everyone's built differently. We're just trying to get you a better study here. We always check the O2 saturations. We look for an O2 sat of greater than 90% on our patients. Uh, we identify a suitable injection site, check to see if they've got an existing IV that we can go through, or if we're gonna place the IV, we look for a, a more proximal site. Again, we use sterile technique. If we're injecting into an existing IV, we check to see if there's any meds running. And again, we never inject into a central line or a PIC line. If meds are running, we call for a nurse to come DC the meds for us, and then we can inject through that line. And then once we've completed the contrast study, we call for the nurse to come back and turn the meds on. We um, communicate with the scanning sonographer as when to inject, when to flush, we ask about the speed of the injection or the need for any additional contrast. Some troubleshooting tips, and, and these are um, usually the sonographers panicking. Why am I not getting a good adequate filling of contrast? Say the apex is not filling properly. Uh, make sure your mechanical index is set properly, and maybe you just need to inject more contrast or inject it faster. If the contrast is dim, check your receiver gains. Uh, maybe you need to increase those, or maybe you just need to uh, inject more contrast. So if we have attenuation, we may want to inject slower or inject less contrast, because too much contrast can also cause attenuation. If we have poor delineation of the endocardial border, we may want to decrease the overall gain or just adjust the compression. When we're acquiring contrast images, this is also important. We want to obtain an apical four-chamber view initially. That's usually the view we start with, and we wait for proper filling or adequate filling of the left ventricle. After we have complete filling, what we want to do is begin acquiring our images, and then in our lab, we acquire them a loop, and then we scroll back and we acquire a frozen frame in diastole and then in systole. And we use these to trace our ejection fraction. Then we go to our two chamber view and we do the same thing. We uh, acquire a few loops and then we stop one at in systole and in diastole to trace our EF. Next, we obtain an apical three chamber view. And then before leaving the three chamber view, we usually add additional contrast while we are in that view to give it time to get to the left ventricle and get out of the right ventricle before we go to our parasternal views. So then next we'll obtain our parasternal long and parasternal short axis views. Again, we want 
the right ventricle to have kind of an undiluted mix of, of contrast in that area. Because if you think about how we do our peristernal views, we have the right ventricle overlaying the left ventricle there. So what will cause shadowing. So we want to make sure that um, the contrast has diluted out of the right ventricle. Additional contrast may also be needed or, or a saline flush when we're in these views and we just have to wait for it to get out of the right ventricle. So we obtain images in the apical views when administering more contrast since the uh, attenuation will occur. So here's some examples of contrast utilization with a transthoracic first. You can see here how we have pushed toward some mild attenuation here in the apex of the ventricle, just in order to see good filling of the apical area. And we also look to make sure that we have a good concentration of contrast throughout the left ventricle and that we can see good endocardial border definition. If we don't have that, what we do is we go back, we tweak our compression, we tweak our TGCs, our overall receiver gains, things like that to help improve the image. Here you can see we've done a frozen image and we've traced the left ventricle there, okay? So we'll trace it in systole and in diastole as well there to get our ejection fraction. Here we utilize contrast for a stress echo and this is our resting image, our impost image and our recovery. And you can see that we have got good filling all the way to the apex, we see a good endocardial border all the way around on all three images. So this one, again, is the difficult one, the impost image, to get the contrast in there at just the perfect timing when that patient just come off the treadmill and hit the bed and we're ready to gather those impost images while the heart rate is still high. Again, um, just to reiterate the tracing of the EF, this is a great place to do that because we can see good border definition and we can get a more accurate EF trace on these patients. And this is important in, in certain subsets of patients, which we'll go over in just a few minutes. So I would encourage you to do this in the four chamber view and also the two chamber view. So here's an, a case that we did been many years ago, but uh, we were utilizing contrast and we were tracing our EFs. The first one here is an unenhanced uh, contrast image. And really looking, I'm not sure there's a lot I would change about this, but the way the sonographer tr uh, traced it or could see the border definition, the EF came out to 38% without contrast. But we really didn't believe that. We thought that there's no way this EF is even 38% because it looked, it looked much lower. We went back, gave the patient contrast, retraced again, and look at the EF there, 18%. So a huge difference, with, uh, which could be huge for that patient. So contrast does help give you a more accurate trace for your ejection fraction. So here's um, an example of peristernal long axis views. The first one here on the left, look at the concentration of the contrast in the right ventricle. A lot of contrast there. We even see some attenuation there at the apex of the RV. And look how it shadows down on the left ventricle. We don't even see good uh, endocardial definition back here at the posterior wall. So we want to make sure that this is undiluted here and that we're seeing um, the maximum amount of our contrast over in the left ventricle. In our next view over to the right here, you can see where we have better filling, a lot less contrast in the right ventricle up here. So at times we'll even maneuver our patients and roll them back slightly. And, and we all know that rolling pulls the RV further over the LV when we um, have the patient roll on their right or uh, on their left side. So we'll just push them back a little bit. And sometimes that will kind of roll the RV off the LV and give us a little better um, view of the left ventricle with contrast. So that can be an important tip that will help you. Also, um, when we're doing transthoracic, sometimes our patients will be so difficult uh, without contrast that we can't even get good accurate measurements of the septum, the LV, and the posterior wall. 
So here's a case where we were able to go ahead and, and get those measurements do the enhancement of the contrast agent. Okay, again, uh, peristernal short axis view, same thing. You want to be real careful to make sure that um, the contrast in the RV has diluted out so you can see adequate imaging here in the left ventricle and obtain good short axis views or, you know, slightly tilt the patient back can also help that patient as well. Can we evaluate the RV with contrast? Absolutely. Here's a case where um, we've injected the contrast and, you know, we know immediately the contrast agent goes in the right ventricle first. So we want to make sure that we're ready to image, ready to collect those loops when we initially inject the agent. So that's what we've done here. While you look over here, there's no contrast in the left ventricle yet. So we've caught it on the uh, first few seconds of the injection and we're able to help identify the uh, RV function a little bit better with this, um, with the utilization of contrast. Other ways we can utilize contrast with Doppler enhancement, here's unenhanced, here's enhanced. Huge difference. It's better than saline contrast because the bubble size is more uniform, so we get a, a little better um, waveform there. So I would encourage you, if, you're, if your Doppler signals are needing a little ump, utilize LVO contrast instead of saline. And of course, you know, in order to get contrast or Doppler gradients over on the left side, you're going to have to use this type contrast. Here's an example of uh, transesophageal. We've kind of zoomed up here on the left atrial appendage and we injected contrast just to ensure there was nothing in the uh, left atrial appendage, such as a thrombus. So it can help with TEEs as well. So here's the apical four-chamber view, and right away you probably notice there's something sitting here in the apex of the left ventricle. Looks like it's, it's pretty much there, and you would say, okay, so surely you're not gonna give this patient contrast. But if you look right here, we can't even see the lateral wall here. So we did move ahead with contrast on this patient to better uh, visualize the lateral wall there. And with contrast, we were able to confirm there is a thrombus in the left ventricular apex, and we were able to see uh, the lateral wall better. So here's another example where Near field wasn't as clear as we liked it. We thought there's probably a wall motion abnormality there, could not rule out whether there's a thrombus there or not. So we moved ahead, gave the patient contrast, and we can easily see now that there's an apical aneurysm there and that there's no thrombus there. Here's a patient with an inferior aneurysm. We also gave this patient contrast just to rule out a thrombus in that area, and we can see that there was good filling of the uh, inferior aneurysm there. We can also look at the um, neck of it, make measurements of the neck of the aneurysm there as well. So, Okay, so why is contrast utilization so important? These three reasons right here. You know, a lot of our patient population now is chemotherapy patients. If they see a decrease uh, in the EF of, of greater than 5%, you know, they may be looking at a change in their chemotherapy regimen. CRT indications, you know, they can, um, and ICD indications less than um, 35%, they can move ahead with these devices and things. So it's really important that we give our ordering physicians a, a good, accurate EF. So how do we make contrast work efficiently? We know that contrast, number one barrier is the administration of the agent. Who's going to give the agent? How are we going to get an IV? Things like that. And that is what slows us down. And that's why people tend not to give contrast as much and, and move ahead when it's needed. So in our lab, we've put measures in place to allow the sonographer to make the call for contrast. And we have them covered by standing order policy, and I'll show you that policy in a minute. But this allows our sonographer not to have to ask the ordering physician or our reading physician whether we give contrast or not. So we can move ahead with it. 
The sonographer checks the O2 saturation to ensure that it's 90 or above. The sonographer administers the IV in our lab. We make all of our sonographers go through a class to where they learn to do this. And, and once they've done that, then the sonographer can also administer the agent. We only ask that if they're going through an existing line that has a med, they involve a nurse in it to uh, DC the med. And we ask that they, you know, not go in a pick line or anything like that. We provide them education initially on how to do all this, and then we provide annual competencies on this as well. So here's our contrast um, administration by a sonographer policy, and it just steps you through that they attend the class, they've, they've read the policy, they uh, have read the package insert, they understand how to, you know, mix the contrast agent and that they, they have to do at least four injections in front of the nurse with each agent and um, that they do annual competencies on this as well. We also have a, a contrast standing order and this pretty much um, goes through and tells our sonographers when they can use contrast, when, when it's beneficial and we follow the ASC guidelines on that. So there's a contrast worksheet um, that we used to use now that we have an electronic um, medical record for the patient. We're um, documenting all this information there, and mainly it's just systolic, diastolic blood pressure, the heart rate. Um, we don't do a respiratory rate anymore, but we do a, a pulse box on everyone and record that within their echo report. So do we have adverse events? We do. But um, luckily, we're very fortunate that they're extremely rare. And if we look at the adverse events for, say, an exercise echo, that is one in 2,500. Look at the, the record that enhancing agents have, much, much lower. And that's what we got to remember. You know, this, you know, the, the benefit is going to outweigh the risk in just about every patient here for us. So. Okay, so some resources that um, ICAS has identified. Uh, you can see that they have some um, resources for you out there. So does SDMS, so does ASE. ASE has an outstanding um, area on their website called Contrast Zone. I would encourage you to go there. ASE has guidelines for contrast usage. I think they just put one out about a year ago, so I would encourage you to uh, review that. And also IEC has um, standards and guidelines that um, pretty much follow the ASC guidelines as well. So there's lots of information out there. The company, uh, contrast company website have a lot of information out there for you as well. Guidelines, they have um, people's uh, different medical centers policies out there to kind of help you get started. So there's lots and lots of information that's available um, as far as resources go for you to help you get started or, or help with any issues that you may have with contrast. Okay, so I think that's going to end this webinar today. And I would just like to thank you for your attendance and your interest in contrast because I do think that continues to make us have better and better echo studies. And, and it shows that we're doing the right thing for our patient and that we're getting um, good quality echocardiograms for our patients. Again, thank you for your interest in contrast.